Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 349. If I can see it and believe it, then I can achieve it. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my Indie Film Hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Music Bed. As filmmakers, we're always looking for songs and music for our projects, but it's such a pain in the butt to license and go get music, and it's just been a nightmare. But Music Bed has changed all of that. You can download a single song, get unlimited music with a subscription, or even create a custom song or score from scratch. They already have over 20,000 songs, beautifully categorized, and their catalog is growing every single day. If you want to check it out, just go to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash music bed. And because you are Indie Film Hustle Tribe members, you get one month for free to try it out or 20% off a single song purchase. Just enter the promo code Indie Film Hustle. Today's show is also sponsored by Blackmagic Design's DaVinci Resolve. And as many of you have known over the years, DaVinci Resolve is my preferred editing software. I edited my first two features on it. I've edited multi-million dollar shows for legendary pictures as well as Hulu and many other projects. It is a workhorse and amazing. It is the only 8K editing software that also has world-class color grading, visual effects, and audio post-production all in one software. And the best thing about it, you can download a copy of it for free. Or you can pay $2.99 to get the full studio package, which is a bargain. If you want to download it, just head over to blackmagicdesign.com. Now, today on the show, I wanted to talk about the state of self-distribution, the state of film aggregators in the wake of the distributor debacle. And I wanted to bring on a guest to really talk about not only the business of where it's been, where it is, but also where it's going to go. And today on the show, we have Klaus Bedelt, and he is the founder of FilmHub.com, which is a new model and new technology that's helping filmmakers get their films out into the world and actually generate income from their films while still maintaining complete control of their product, of their film and catalog. And I wanted to bring Klaus on to discuss a lot of the stuff that's going on with Distributor, how you can protect yourself, how you can get your movie back, how you can file a copyright claim with these platforms if Distributor does not release your film back to you. There are multiple ways of getting your movie back, at least control of your movie back, and then figure it all out as far as the money you're owed. But at least the most important thing is to get your movie back. And you really need to move very quickly on this because if they do file for bankruptcy, it will be very, very complicated and difficult for you to get those movie rights back or to get access to your movie back to be able to put up on these platforms. But we go over this, we discuss different distribution models, and of course we talk about the film entrepreneur method of how to become an entrepreneurial filmmaker. So without any further ado, Please enjoy my conversation with Klaus Bedelt. I'd like to welcome to the show Klaus Bedelt. How you doing, brother? Great. How are you? Thank I'm you. I'm good, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And we're going to get deep into this whole distribution and distributor thing. And I really wanted to kind of pick your brain about distribution in general, self-distribution, and all sorts of other cool things we're going to talk about. But before we jump in, how did you get into the film business? Yeah, so uh, my my – Quick story, 18 years, I had the, the first tech startup. At the time, we didn't call it a tech startup yet. Back in Germany, it was like IBM and stuff. You don't even. So I sold that at uh, 24, realized I need to do what I always want to do. That's a music and that's film. So I'm, I sold my shares, went on to, uh, you know, to do film music. I came to Hollywood, so to say, Los Angeles. Um, End of 90s, um, I was on vacation, got stuck here, and then had a career, if you want, as a uh, film composer. I did over, oh my gosh, over 100 movies, I think, by, by now, um, including Pirates of the Caribbean, um, 
I did the Beijing Olympics closing ceremony. I did um, wow. Time Machine. I worked a lot on Gladiator. So many movies. Um, none of the, those which are on your wall in the back. No. <laughs> no, no. Those are all my movies, sir. I'm sorry. Okay, good. So I, we it's would all know. about it's all about me, sir. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and you see, I have no posters. I uh, I have to always look up myself on imdb to realize to remember what i did so it was just it's a big blur the last 20 years and then um, just a few years ago um you know look obviously i worked in the industry a lot i worked in uh, uh, with the big studios here lots of major motion pictures but my heart really belongs in, in uh, into like independent film i did a lot of films in china in france uh, indie films here of course and um, I realized that there was a big uh, paradigm shift in how we watch movies. Uh, video streaming came up. Um, no, it's not that long ago that you know we had DVDs, right? I mean, it's still do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I saw also because I'm a musician too. I saw what happened in the music industry before. Uh, there's a democratization going on that you, as an artist, now didn't need these record companies. I was in the music industry before film industry. I know how uh, crazy that industry is. How. Uh, hostile to the creator and i saw in a way the same thing i worked on movies which never saw the light of day never got out wide or at all and i wonder this is so great what i'm doing what we're doing there what others are doing why not and now since everyone is video video streaming there should be no more um nobody in between nobody telling you your movie is not good enough or Mm -hmm. no audience for this or or making deals and suits, and I, I found this whole industry. I'm a very anti-corporate guy. I I, uh, mm-hmm. I believe in, in creators should have the power, um, and that's how I got into like I put a team together and said, well, let's do something where we use technology. I'm an old techie, as you now know, and it's use technology to bypass this old system, which is, by the way, of course, that system which you know wrote me the checks all the time. But so. It, so I, I did this fine balance between, look, I'm still a, an industry player if you want, like I still work in the industry, but also um, have the knowledge, I, I would say, to disrupt it from the inside. Very cool. That, that, I, that's, I had no idea that you were so deep in the, the composing space, sir. I had no, no idea. I thought, I thought you were a tech guy that was into distribution. So, um, the market, the marketing is working, sir. Uh, Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's great because I have, it's funny when we went to Silicon Valley to do all the, the you know, the pitches, etc. Um, it's hard for people to understand or believe that I do both. Yeah, but it's very common in our, especially in music. You have all these um, writing music for, especially for movies. It's a, um, it's a very thorough craft, and um, it has to do with math. There's a lot of technology involved. I mean, I came here first time. I worked with Hans Zimmer at the time, and mm-hmm. I, um, I said, well, what are you guys doing? Why do you have all these? Let's use computers. It's so much faster. Uh, to write music with it, it's leveraged the technology, and we went from, I don't know, I had like fifty samplers and f- you know mixing the Neve, consoles. The Neve panel, oh, yeah. Yeah. which is love. Don't get me wrong, but mm. you had to write. You know, film music means change. That's what I learned here, right? It means change. It's always going along with the directors, with the with the writers, with the editors. It's not to like defend your music and say, oh, but this is bad. You should. No, you need to make changes, and for that you need computers. Otherwise, it's like writing on paper. You know, we're not. You know, you're not recording this on two-inch tape, right? So, oh God, I remember those days as well. Jeez. <laughs> no, but is it is it isn't it true that every composer that that lands in Los Angeles has to go to Hans Zimmer's office? Like it's <laughs> it's so, part it is is part of you have to, or else you just don't work in the business. You have to walk in, spend time there, and then you're allowed to leave. It's kind of like the doorway, isn't it? <laughs> Actually, you're not allowed to leave. <laughs> <laughs> if you're lucky, you escape. If you're lucky, <laughs> right. you escape. I was but no, guy. I have, yeah, I have, no, it's, it's true that you you pass by God, and <laughs> <laughs> and uh, on the way you. No, I mean that, that was also uh, for a while a great place to. Uh, I thought of democratizing. You know, I'm always like this. It's it wasn't at the time a um, a, 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 a power play. It was more like you know nurturing your talent. Um, of course, you learn that you know ultimately it's. Well, I don't want to say. Too much, but it's not ultimately about that there. But um, I I made it like that for me. I, mm-hmm. I uh, learned a lot there. Um, I wouldn't say I learned mu- writing music, but everything else around it. Um, 
you don't get out there with relationships. But that's always, I mean, that's now maybe my advice to young filmmakers, not only direct, uh, not only film composers, is there's two ways of doing things to me. It's like, we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Either you, I don't know, you intern for the big guys and you work your way up inside that system and until you have th- you, you have some real chips and you get out and then you do your own thing. Um, big plus is you get in fairly quickly if you have the way in. Um, big minus is it's almost impossible to escape the big gorillas. On the other hand, there's this, what I saw with others, and I actually said that too, you find, um, I don't know, a student director or, you know, as a composer or as a, as a director, find a student composer and, and grow together and build a partnership if you trust that person. Um, those relationships happen too, and then they're beautiful and for, for long term, and there's really trust in, for the creator and built in. Yeah, like Burton and Elfman and Spielberg and Williams, like these guys, that's what they do. I mean, I, I think Williams, I think was one, I think the last one he didn't do, or there was, I think he's done pretty much every Spielberg movie, but I think either the last one or one of these, he just didn't, was, I don't know. But, yeah, but yeah, but exactly. pretty much it's always there. He's always there. And I, I tell you a little anecdote, I mean, I don't know how much time you have, but uh, Steven Spielberg sat next to me and said, I cannot believe you guys let me listen to the music. Because here's how it works with Johnny. Um, he sees him twice, once when they watch the movie and then on the recording stage. Oh, actually, three times. Sorry, I'm lying. After a few weeks, he goes, I think he, he's invited for dinner. Then Johnny plays on the piano. And Steven says, I have no idea what's going to happen. Oh, yeah, I've totally lost control. I have everything under control on the, on the film, right? But not music. So it, it, for him, especially, it's a... It's a big, big trust game. Now, okay, t- today we have more technology. We can play music. And I always did this as a part of filmmaking, right? Mm-hmm. Not, so you, you, it's, it's a handful of key creatives on the film, and, and you build this together. It's like the, the quintessential multimedia project. Multimedia. I haven't heard that term used in quite right? some time. That's, yeah, you've, da- like, you've dated yourself, sir. <laughs> cool. I mean, come on. I have, I have all stories. I know too much and not enough to be dated. So uh, I, I'm going to have to ask you back so we can have a whole episode just on your journeys in Hollyweird and your composing and all that stuff. Because I can, we could just sit there and talk about Johnny and Stevie all day. Um, but today, the reason we brought you on is because uh, you know you are – uh, an expert in the distribution pl- in the distribution arena uh, with the company that you run, Film Hub, and you know we were brought together by this unfortunate debacle that is Distribber and the uh, horrors that has been going on in the film industry because of it. So first, what are your thoughts on this entire Distribber debacle? Yeah, so I mean, there is a lot of um, companies in our industry which. To me, even distributor counts into this old school. This is kind of a newer school, but old school. Here's here's the difference. So we have distribution companies, aggregators. Distribution companies to me are service businesses. Mm-hmm. You pay them, and then they take some. But ultimately, they want uh, your money first, right? I mean, I've seen distribution deals not with distributor, but distribution deals a lot where you pay. Up front, uh, or they withhold. It's it's a, it's a bit like music uh, recording suppose, artist, or as a post production house. You're paying a for a service. Paying for a service, right? And um, and you have no control over how it's been spent. That's the worst to me, mm. right? So you accept that, like a distribution company does um, marketing, but uh, you know they, they talk to you, but you have no word. <laughs> uh, no maybe idea. if you're lucky, they talk to you. Uh, so distributor is to me uh, like the not next generation, but like the same thing. Um, I, uh, look, what what I think is wrong with this industry that uh, aggregators or distribution companies are very similar to me. Um, they provide service. They don't um, open access, but they just buy for your money. Mm-hmm. And there's something inherently wrong with this. Um, now. They have very very little value to add. That's the problem, right? They're What's, just a door. There's a doorway. It's just basically a, they're just gatekeepers. That's all they, they are. They're gatekeepers. And um, now, what what's 
better about aggregators and the distributor is that they don't say no so much because mm -hmm. their risk is financial risk is relatively low compared to um, dis distribution companies who can only take like I don't know ten movies a year because they have to put the human resources behind this and and the lawyers and it's and make contracts is very complicated and they keep it very complicated. Um, so it's a bit more streamlined how distributor did it, but still it's service, which I think like why. What mm -hmm. is what is in there? The the uh, there is no there's not much much value. Now the problem when a company like this goes out of business, um, and I don't want to necessarily say like uh, look, yeah, I saw the writing on the wall. They were not like kosher or something. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. I mean, it could have been fine. And if you're willing to pay to play, that's kind of like this thing, mm -hmm. right? All right. Well, then then you still. See this. Look, I, um, I'm touching so many grounds. Sorry, but it, it, you, we have to re-educate us filmmakers to get a way of thinking, of trophy thinking. Like success and getting into Sundance is the trophy. Getting a signed deal is a trophy. It's I, I, I call it the lottery ticket mentality. Okay. Yeah, there it's very it's very similar. Like you're always looking for that that lottery ticket that's going to give you. Everything that you've ever dreamed of, which is like I get into Sundance, I get a huge distribution deal, I'll and, and then Marvel, Kevin Feige, he's going to call and I'm going to do the next Marvel movie because he saw my five thousand dollar independent film at Sundance, which I shot on my iPhone. Like that's the the delusion. That is the delusion of of us filmmakers. I made a whole movie about the delusions of filmmakers because we're wanna, crazy. I'm sorry, I didn't see it yet, but I, it, it hasn't come out yet. It's coming out soon, okay. but uh, but it's but we're crazy. We're, we're we're, we're we're nuts. <laughs> it is and it's and it's so dated in its thinking because look, music always there's nice parallel. It's only like mm -hmm. to me it's like a seven, eight year shift, right? We we in music are eight years ahead of uh, the other guys of in, in film. I I see myself on the film industry. Is that um you today you write a hit on your on your Pro Tools at home, or not mm -hmm. even Pro Tools, right? On your able life, you know, you just did it, did it, did it, and something out really cool comes out. And you stay with that. You do not need to sign a deal because you can distribute it into the world and get to an audience. That's the idea today as a musician. Um, we film, I can still think if I, if I don't sign, I'm a failure. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a old mentality. Kiss yeah. of death. If you sign a distribution deal, it's kiss of death. You, you're signing away um, so much. I mean, we have so many filmmakers. Look, uh, we're on the platform, we have uh, like 20,000 titles right now. And there's so many stories attached to these and so much hope and uh, so much bad experience, so much education we have to do because most filmmakers are so burned already. With the first film, it like yeah. I have not had like a great. <laughs> I don't. I don't know any good example. Um, every every filmmaker, pretty much, and I've said this multiple times, is that by the time you get to distribution, you're exhausted, you're broke, your spirit is broken because you didn't get into Sundance, right? You it didn't it didn't blow up like Reservoir Dogs or you know or any of these big movies from the '90s, you know these big independent films that just exploded people's careers. When that the reality hits. That's when you get to distribution. And then that's when the predatory distributors show up and go, look, I'll take it. Uh, I can't give you any money, but it's going to be a 15-year deal. And uh, it's about it's, – we'll cap the expenses at 250000 So like and, – and, and you just like I signed. And I feel that the scariest part about it is that there's certain companies, which will remain nameless, but there's certain distribution companies who have high-profile names. And because of their perceived – value and perceived auth like uh, authority in the space you know i'm not talking like a24 or the or you know or neon these guys take five ten movies they're like basically they're the sundance of of distributors i'm talking about these other guys who, who are putting out 40 movies a month they'll people will sign with them they're like oh i got with this company look and 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 but they get no money they get no money <laughs> we have to get away from this branding thinking in, instead we have to take control and call this, I call this the ownership model. Mm -hmm. I have one good example for you. Werner Herzog with a Werner Herzog as we yeah. pronounce him. Werner, <laughs> yes. Werner, yeah. So look, he, the first, I don't know, 10 movies he did, including Fitzcarraldo and all these beautiful classics and sure. icons, right? Um, and they're still like, when he has a show here on, in Santa Monica, the Arrow, uh, there's still 500 
super young, hungry filmmakers coming, not like the old guys like me, right? Like, that's like, yeah. it's a new generation who totally gets it. He owns all these movies. He did this for 80,000 Deutschmark, you know, and people died on his set and planes, <laughs> planes crashed and, and war started. But he did it, right? He did this guerrilla filmmaking uh, par excellence into big cinema epic. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. He owns them. Uh, he makes a living with these movies today. That's amazing. But they're still being, you know, licensed out here and there. A film that must be shown and et cetera, et cetera. Um, all the movies he recently did, let's say last 10, 20 years, he, once he's, you know, um, arrived in Hollywood, he, he doesn't own. And he tells me also, look, Klaus, I wouldn't be here where I am if I wouldn't have my old catalog. That's the ownership model. Interesting. So, and to, I don't know how we, I asked him many times, how did you do this at the time? What did you get? Yeah, from? I mean, that was insane. Like, it's not like he just jumped, you know, grabbed a red or, you know, grabbed a black magic camera and went off and shot a movie. And there was, it was film. Yeah. 35. Crazy. Like, in the jungle. He's lifting the ship over. Like, <laughs> he's a madman. So today, so we did, I think three movies or four together. So he tells me <sighs> um, the only thing difference today would be he would like a hotel close to the set. <laughs> he's, the rest, he's, I mean, he's a madman. And I, I remember his stories. I heard a story of his where I think it was in his master class. I don't remember where I heard it, but it was the, the story where he, he um, forged permits or forged some yeah. sort of like paperwork yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, it was a passport or a passport or some, oh, some yeah, sort yeah. of papers that the, 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 they came over and he's like, oh, no, don't hold on. Hold on. So I'll go get them for you. He went back to like his uh, you know, bathroom somewhere and like grabbed some papers and forged them and brought it back to the police. And they said, yeah, sure. Not okay, everything. it's fine. But he's, he's a madman. And I love that yeah. about him and his work. Yeah. <laughs> it's just no compromise. And so was like now back to distribution, right? So was his, I think his brother is managing mostly the catalog, but he owns it. They own it. So now we need to not get back to this. We need to really embrace this with today's technology. And it's a completely different A to Z like arc, right? Not story wise, but now from creation to consumer watching, audience watching it. Look. Today, the situation is like, like this. There is unlimited shelf space. Mm -hmm. There's no more blockbuster where you, that fits only 40 movies in the first top room. Mm. Literally, yeah, unlimited. It's hard, hard like cloud space, whatever. Second, distribution cost is nearly zero. Well, how much does it possibly cost to get a, you know, a video stream to India? Mm -hmm. no, nothing. I mean... So, so you might think like this is great for independent filmmaking. Now we can actually get for, go for the audience. Here's what really happens: is our industry has not changed a bit. We're doing exactly the same thing as we do before. Um, I mean, now distribution industry, um, you know, deals, contracts, film markets, um, offline mm -hmm. markets. You have to travel to Cannes, where I just was, and and to to Toronto to make a deal. I, I mean, like. So with this, I, I went to Silicon Valley um, to raise funding, and we got funding in Silicon Valley because it was so hard, um, I can um, say this openly, to, to raise funds in Hollywood. Because if at all, people told me, I mean, I have so many contacts here, I thought it would be easy to raise funds. They said, well, most of them said, mm, um, I know you're right, but I don't want you to be right. I want that. It, they, want the status quo, they want the status quo to stay in check. Yeah, yeah. I don't, don't want to disrupt it. That the dinosaur, you can't disrupt the dinosaur with the dinosaur. And then in Silicon Valley, look at me like, what are you doing? I don't understand even why, why that's not, that should be so easy, right? And said, that should yeah. be the way of doing it. Yeah. yeah. It's, it, it's funny when you, when you approach people outside of Hollywood and they, and you show them the system, the actual inner workings of this stuff, business people will look at it and go, Huh? This, is this legal? Like, how is this, how is this, how does this work? Like, what do you mean there's no escrow account? How is there no fiduciary responsibility for a film aggregator? Like, how is this not a thing? Right. Um, and that's, and I think honestly, and, I, and I, I've talked about, it, I opened up an entire platform and wrote it and, and releasing a new book about this specific idea of being the entrepreneurial filmmaker, 
owning your own property and creating multiple revenue streams from your movie, as in even the movie itself is not the major revenue stream. There's multiple people out there who've built company, million, multi-million dollar companies based off of one film. But that's the mentality that has to be the change in people because right now – in film schools are taught this this crap system. Everywhere you turn, all the experts are telling you, no, you got to make your movie. You got to put Eric Roberts and Tom Sizemore in the movie, uh, or Danny Trejo, uh, <laughs> and put them in the movie. It's gonna, and you take it to AFM or Can, and and then you're and you, you have to keep the budget around a million uh, or something like that, or you buy or you get Nicolas Cage, and then you can spend three million dollars <laughs> on, on on a project because it automatically <laughs> sells in China. But this uh, old kind of mentality of doing things is what is still being you know, perpetrated on independent filmmakers. And these younger generation, they have no idea because they just look at these, these, you know, whatever distribution gods or film experts. And they just look at them and go, well, he, he made 50 movies or they've released 50 movies. They must know what they're talking about. I don't know what I'm talking about. So I think that's what you and I both are trying to do is educate as much as humanly possible. Exactly. And by the way, you can't blame the um, filmmaker. Like you said, this, this, the school's, uh, teach that also it's a very opaque system by these privateers right it, there's no absolute no transparency what so what we need to do is also counter with this with transparent operations and very and just to simplify it like the emperor's new clothes like there's nothing to it right right so let's get your movie out but it's ownership you got to work for it you got to make sure that you do it a for you make it for an audience Mm-hmm. And you raise an audience, right? You like wh- who are you talking to? Like, just do this, do this. Do, Come would on. you would you agree that the niche audience is the future for filmmakers? Like, absolutely. It, you and can't make a broad it- you can't make a broad spectrum romantic comedy at fifty thousand dollars and expect it to do anything. Exactly, and it's I I don't call it niche anymore. I call this vertical um, because niche has this like underdog, like small ish to it. Okay. So, so here's my my bold and cunning theory is this. So, before we had to follow the broadcast model, one product for millions. It had to be out from you know one to many. Now the internet is not even built for that. The internet is built for many to many, many servers, many consumers. If you have a broadcast, it's actually quite difficult to do, like mm-hmm. a live broadcast from. Oh no, like I, the Olympics or something like that. Exactly. It's like it's, it's hard. It's hard, you know, and they have to distribute the technology so it's actually not one to many. So now let's think about this and say, if you are, and it's the same thinking also, if you are now have a, a narrow but strong community who or audience, who is your potential audience, you can make now a living and you can make a mon- make money. You might not make the next Batman um, revenue, but, but by the way, it could happen. It's like easy. You make one for sure. one point five and you make sixty. But there's like this 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 uh, lottery is in there too. But um, as long as you own it, you don't have to make that much in order to actually be a creator and keep being a creator. And you can find your audience even in the narrow segment. People don't have to tell you anymore, well, you know, your, your, your audience is too, too narrow segmented. Um, they, and you might be surprised what, I mean, you, you live in this topic. There's, oh, there's in many stories, there's a certain topic or uh, touches certain subjects. And then uh, there's a lot of um, proximity to um, other um, outside the movie thinking um, to other groups, other communities. Um, we run this technology, we're building this technology based on lots of AI in there where we create proximities between movies. And even the early tests, uh, beginning of the year, showed us where um, two movies are similar, which we as humans would have never thought they would actually have some overlap. And that's based on we, we use um, actually image recognition and uh, you know full text search because we have caption files and etc. So the we create like a DNA of a film. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean this movie is good and you like the other one necessarily too, but because it might be not as good. Okay, well it's hard to say what is a good movie or not. Um, if you, if you tell me one day if you have a formula for what's a good movie, let me know. Um, <laughs> I, I tried over a hundred times myself and it, I can't figure it out. <laughs> Um, That's why but, we're, we have such a crazy business. It's not we're not making a bottle of Coca Cola, we're not making a soda. We're not like you can determine. It's just so hard. It's creative. It's art. It's super hard. It's super hard, and 
it's super hard because you always have to be, I mean, so many reasons, but you have to be so close in detail and attention to detail. And then you have to step back and somebody says, well, I don't get the story here. Like, oh, shoot, yeah, there's a story we have to tell too, right? So um, there's a lot to this. But, but I think distribution and promotion and everything is like, look, it's your baby, right? So you, 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 why would you want to just give it up on birth? Oh, God, I know. I mean, I mean, you, you, I mean it just it, it makes me cringe because I know you're you're telling the absolute truth, and it's maddening to me. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Because I've seen filmmakers who've mortgaged their home for three, four hundred thousand dollars. They put this movie together and then they literally hand it over to a stranger. To, I mean, in what, in what business ever does someone spend $400,000 on a product and literally just hand it over to Crazy. somebody else and hope in good faith that that person will eventually do right by your movie, right by you and actually pay you and do right. what they say they're going to do? In what world is that that even live? <laughs> And now the opportunity, right? So we are in the video streaming, beginning of the video, still the beginning of video streaming age. Um, we do believe a, a little bit way too much, I think, into uh, to, to uh, Netflix and, and the three or four majors in America. Well, we'll get to this maybe, hopefully we have time, but um, because there's so much more opportunity. But um, you do not need to do everything yourself. That doesn't mean you are a good, you have to be a good marketer. Um, you can, for example, work with and hire a la carte the best teams in the world which by the way do the same for the studios only for much more you know higher fees which i would charge more of course if one of us calls you but mm. you have because they the studios don't know themselves either really it, they hire these talent you know that's that's the plus of the studio so now you can do that too mm -hmm. you can get uh we for example we're compiling a uh, uh like a collaboration if you want a, a, a list a, a how do you call this like a like partnership list of of marketing agencies these are usually small groups two to eight um, people uh, offices in every part of, of the world so you have your team in australia you have your team in uh, pacific asia you know you, you should look at definitely at europe um, of course not forget about you know domestic here but so but there's um so much opportunity now that there's a full access digital world out there and um, we need to build and use and embrace the tools and um, it, it's it is an opportunity it's not um, like it's not it's not more difficult it's actually much easier now do, do you I think the, 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 the problem that the systemic problem for this entire conversation we're having for is that filmmakers don't think about this as part of the creative process. They think that making the product is the beginning and the end of their of the because that's the sexy part. That's the right. fun part. That's the fun. No one no one ever woke up in the morning. Well, I guess a few people, but not many people wake up in the morning going, mm, Facebook ads. Yes. Like it ha it, it, mm. don't trust me. I, I want that person who wakes up and goes, Facebook ads, yes. You know, <laughs> or, or marketing, yes. You know, um, I'm a marketer and I have been all my life, uh, but I'm also a filmmaker. So, but most filmmakers think that all I have to worry, because it's so, such a, just moving that rock up the hill to get money to make a movie, to produce a product, to finish it, get it mastered, delivered, and then film yeah. festivals, if they want to go down that, and then distributors. And then, but that's the old model where at the beginning, if they begin with like, who is this movie for? Hmm. What, who is my audience how can I reach that audience? What is the budget that this audience will justify? Huge question that needs to be answered because I, I could have a niche audience. I always use my vegan chef movie. I always tell people, if you're going to make a, a romantic comedy, make a romantic comedy about a vegan chef who meets a barbecue uh, barbecue champion and all hell breaks loose, right? And you could target- Wait, Did you make this already? No, I, I, everybody, no, I have a whole, uh, <laughs> in my book, I actually lay out the entire story. I was like, I should make this. Um, talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> but you you focus on on something like that, and you're like, okay, so the vegans, the ve I'm going to focus on vegans, vegetarians, people who like plant based. Let's say I'm going to focus on that audience. Is that going to justify a twenty million dollar budget? Probably not. 
Will that justify a hundred thousand dollar budget? Maybe. So you have to figure out what's how much is that product budget worth? I agree, dude. I worked on hundred million dollar movies, which were this should have been twenty five. <laughs> right. I mean Harrison Ford and and you know, the marketing <laughs> had to put in shots into the trailer which didn't even they weren't even shot for the movie. I mean this is complete betrayal to the audience just to justify the budgets. You know. Of course. Crazy, crazy stuff. So no, of course, and you don't need you don't need this. Uh, I per, look. I worked, for example, with every type of budget. I did movies for Virtual Unlimited, and I did projects with one dollar or something. Yeah. Um, actually, literally one dollar, and um, and I paid ten cents to my agent. Um, <laughs> Of course. I, of course. And did you go in and hand it cash or did you write exactly. a check? I think no. I think I think a check and then send it to him by mail and put the stamp on it that costs 32 cents. That is how our industry works. <laughs> That's that sums up the efficiency of what we do. It's basically it's an episode of Seinfeld. <laughs> yeah, that's it's for every situation in life there's an episode of Seinfeld here but so like look and now to the practicalities of this. I I um Distributor is not the only distribution company going out of business. Unfortunately, it was probably the hope of many new filmmakers and like the hope of like, oh, things could do differently. Um, but they didn't do it too differently, I, I would think. Anyway, so what you can do is um, – I'm not a legal expert. Uh, I'm sure you, you have probably much better sources for this. What we have been doing in these cases is um, – we help with uh, filing um, uh, complaints to the channels because usually what happens is that, right? There's nothing happening. I, I had actually movies in production and pre-production stuck in these kind of situations. So suddenly you lose your cast mm -hmm. because you it, can't move it forward. So here at least there's a bit better, better hope. So we can help with filing complaints to these. Um, um, these are more or less like uh, copyright notices. Um, this is now these are, and just, just to be clarified, these are from people who are dealing with distributor that their movies are still locked up on this uh, on the platforms Sorry. through distributors, and then they can't get the movies down because distributor either can't or won't release the films or pull those things down. So now the filmmakers lost their movie, lost their money, and can't access their film anymore. So now this is what you're talking about helping. Yes, exactly. It's sorry, exactly. That's the, that's the situation for many now, and I, I'm sure they're desperate. And many have not been paid or not been paid for a long time. Um, so again, not to be not to give legal advice, which I'm so, so the wrong person. But in general, how, yes, how it works. So uh, your distribution company is in breach of the contract because they didn't pay you, or they didn't pay you in time, etc. Um, so what we can then help you with is because we've done it so many times we have relationships there you we go to the channels and file a certain document so that there's a takedown notice if then that puts the ball into distributor court again meaning if they don't respond which they probably don't because they can't they have the time yeah you you actually have it signed over to you so we can either take it down or we can sign it and you know, they can get it so back will it will it, if so let's say it's on amazon in, in this, you go through this process of filing the the, the copyright claim. If you uh, will, they take it down, or will they just switch the rights? So meaning that all the reviews and things stay up there. Ninety nine point nine percent, they take it down, and you have to get it back up on your own. And do um, you lose your reviews and all all that? Exactly, that's the big problem. But um, we were not to pride ourselves, but we were able, especially with Amazon, because we have thousands of movies up there, to like talk to them, which even though for us, it's hard to talk to Amazon. Um, and some we were able to shift over. Uh, that also means that the revenue stream, was, which was accumulated at the, you know, for a while, could be switched over to. Oh, okay. And it would be from day, and you would get the revenue from day one again. Um, if they didn't pay out yet, um, Amazon, for example, as far as I know, I'm not into operation, it does pay by automatic payment. So it, mm -hmm. meaning if if it's not a check which could be stale unfortunately meaning um, but, in, but but right now the so right now the movies that are up through distributor the movies are still up there people are still renting still buying and still streaming it on on uh, svod that money is arguably still going to distributor right so that you have about 3 months now to freeze it uh, so you have to act quickly that the money which is rather have amazon accumulate than paying out distributor right? mm -hmm. at this point i would say uh, um, now i'm not aware if distributor really 
filed um, they have not filed bank- they have not filed bankruptcy they're you know, re- or- they hired a firm that is uh, re- they're reorganizing specialists but if you look deeper they're bankruptcy they're a bankruptcy company to reorganize the company stop the bleeding set yeah. things up and then pretty much prepare it for either bankruptcy or They'll try to go find money to reinvest. Who's going to spend money on that? That brand is pretty much dead at this point. So no one's going to infuse any cash into this business because the model is ridiculous. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And there was gross mismanagement and all of this kind of stuff with the money. So there's no signs at least from my point of view and from the people, my, my little birdies in the business who talk to me on the side, there's no, there's no hope that I see that this is going to come. They're going to come out of this. Like there's Jim. go digital distributor, any of these guys, the, the companies, they're not going to be able to come back out and start business as usual. It just, it's not going to work. And I, uh, again, I'm not a legal expert. Then I would recommend very, very quickly before their file, Yes. File your compliance because once they file for bankruptcy, it's protected and it's much harder for you to get at the assets. Mm. And then it's, it might now, be stuck but, in that. So let me ask you a question. How is that considered an asset? Because it's not, they're just a service. They're like you said, they're a high, you're hiring them for a service. So they're not a distribution company per se. They are an aggregator. So that means that you're they're just did my job so arguably the films that they've put up they're not their assets they're just they don't things. Have the right that's right they don't have the rights to them but um they're still considered like an asset because um just by having access to it and and the money flows through them and also Ugh. um i understand in the fine print of these aggregators they always say like you get 100 percent and you only pay up front only <laughs> but um also that's not true um, there's always a yearly fee you have to pay for your movies for other reasons. Uh, they call them the money differently. I, mean, what's up, I saw the um, this article by Stephen Follows who actually broke down all, everything from from distributor. And there was – because I, I joined them years ago, so I wasn't – I didn't do any of this. I was, I was grandfathered in. But currently, it's like you had to spend 20 bucks to get a check. Yeah, exactly. To get paid, <laughs> you needed to spend twenty dollars. Like pay to get paid. Nice, huh? Right. It was huh? like, what scam is this? And then on top of that, a two hundred a two hundred dollar a year keep it right. up on the platform fee, and you could just tell that they were just. It was yeah, yeah. the water was just coming and coming. Oh God, yeah, it's yeah, so brutal. But I want to I, I want to ask you this because you you mentioned a couple things in regards to the money flowing through them. I mentioned this in one of my my live broadcasts in regards to this problem, that unlike a distributor, a distributor has uh, – you have choices of thousands of distributors. And if you decide to go into business with a distributor and they screw you over or do whatever they're going to do, that's on you because you had multiple choices uh, around the world that you could have gone with. But with aggregators, there's arguably five that all the platforms – force you to use. And it's not just us. The major studios are forced to go through them as well. So on a liability standpoint, I know we're not attorneys, but on a liability standpoint, Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, iTunes, Apple, they they have to have some sort of responsibility because they force people to go through. Like if you get a Netflix deal, I could call up Netflix right now and Netflix is like, I want to buy your movie for a, a, a half a million dollars. I'm like, great. Okay, how do I send it to you? You have to go through one of these companies. And this is the company that we want you to go through. And oh, by the way, we're going to send our check to that company. And that company is then going to pay you. So you see how ludicrous this situation is. So it, it, I feel that there is some sort of liability towards the, the platforms. Would you agree, disagree? That's true because uh, after all, you had to use them. That's an interesting thought. I, uh, iTunes was the uh, the first one uh, yeah. to actually be there, right? And uh, by the way, I don't, we don't feel that they are of any significance any more no. for quite a while, right? I mean, they haven't been, right? Okay, yeah, I, I we feel this too. Um, we see it in our data, but um, so they have. The only ones who are really officially putting this on the website is there's these encoding houses and these aggregators, they call them. Even the aggregators have to use the encoding houses um, because in, you have to go through an aggregator or 
in, in coding because these are the only ones who have a business relationship with Apple, the encoding houses. So even less there's a value for these of, of you know, what these aggregators provide. So this is I never honestly understood. This, this is also like where's the Empress New Clothes? Where where what? Huh? Why do you have to do that? Um, I understand that Apple cannot deal with thousands of uh, content providers, mm -hmm. um, and something like this makes sense also to to let's say normalize the technical quality. That that makes sense in a way, um, but from from business standpoint, it's it's um, it, it, this goes back to like okay Netflix, because you mentioned it. Um, I want to say this too is um, while at the beginning when Netflix was the first one to come out with like here's a new way of like streaming to consumers um, I've, their development to me is it, it was a big hope for, for independent film right now we have a direct outlet for our stuff we create um, unfortunately you might have noticed many might not have noticed it is the exact opposite it turned into another HBO or they want to be another Warner Brothers they want to create a studio which they complete control 52% uh, of last year was already like uh, um, their own production they are, if you are in the business of getting a um, co-production deal which is also a kiss of death to me. Like you, you get what you get. They don't give you any data. It's it's really it's mm -hmm. much worse than Warner Brothers or so. They get no back end. They get no back end. Or very nothing, rare. Nothing. Right. Right. But it's not that you make a movie and then you go to Netflix and they license it. I mean, it's less and less. The chances are they don't even want that anymore. They they. Um, it's a very very different and still it's the it's a very old studio like business model, um, which is the opposite of the hope for independent filmmakers. It's actually now less hope. It's even less for filmmakers now open what to do because now the studios do less movies. Before they did two hundred in this town, now they do like what twelve a year, right? So that's, yeah, but instead of tw instead of two hundred that cost twenty million, twenty five million with the occasional one hundred million dollar movie, now they do twelve that cost two hundred two hundred million dollars each because right. they are not in the business of making. Making a twenty-five million dollar to make two hundred million. They're in the business of making two hundred million to make a billion. Right, exactly. And That's now, insane. at the same time, we with digital production pipelines and you know, production qualities we can do today with very little investment. I'm, I'm, I'm here saying with a good idea and good execution, you can do any movie now, mm -hmm. and it looks like a million dollars. No, it looks like hundred million dollars. No, it looks like solid, lot solid production value. It doesn't look like a video. It looks really like something where people would be fooled into believing this was done by, you know, the old brands. Prof professionals. Professionals. <laughs> which we are, right? I mean, yes, so exactly. just good talent and, again, digital production, um, used right, fantastic opportunity. Now, so there's more and more content being produced i call this sorry content as a businessman here but but you know in movies shows um we have these what we look down on, on in our industry these youtubers who create content which is 100 billion times being viewed this is the new tv shows of today right this is cool stuff i mean there's some crap with stuff, no cost like with no cost with barely any cost i've said this right. i've said this a, a bunch of i said this a bunch of times that an hour is an hour Regardless if that hour costs $100 million or is just me talking, it's an hour of attention. And the more eyeballs you can get on that hour, it doesn't really matter if it costs $100 million or if it's just Tony Robbins talking to you for an hour about self-help. Right. It, it, it doesn't matter. And so, that's what scares the hell out of the industry, I think. Exactly. So they don't know. Nobody's taking care of these, what, you know, these, I call them, well, some call them the digital first creators. Um, mm -hmm. They jail to YouTube at this point. That shouldn't be the case either. YouTube pays like SH, nothing. you know, like, it's just nothing. You need uh, Patreon and others to actually make a living out of YouTube. How, how ridiculous is that? So this has to all change. And this is exactly what, what I stand for. It's like to find ways with technology to like, guys, we got to change our way of looking at things. And um um, again, this is not look. It's not uh, as you hopefully now feel. It's not advertisement for film or film hub or anything. But it's it's my it's my I despise how this old system works. And not only that, I want to look, disrupt it. Create, you want to disrupt, disrupt it. it? I want to create a. Let's say it's my legacy. Like yes, I've done a few movies, but this is I can I can almost no longer do one movie at a time. I I want to now help thousands and hundreds of thousands and I feel, there I feel are you. 
I feel you. <laughs> yeah, you know, right. I mean, you're doing it too, right? You're doing your own stuff creatively, but you see the problems everyone has, and yeah. like you, you don't sit still. You actually help, and that's exactly what I'm doing too. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree, and it's it's and personally, I find it addictive to to be of service to a community or to be of service to people because it, it, on a selfish standpoint, it just feels really good uh, to be able to help. Like I literally talked to a filmmaker yesterday. And they had their plan set up to like, oh, we're going to go the festival route and we're going to do this and this. And we submitted to all the big festivals. And I looked at the movie and I said, no. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. No, this is not a movie for for the, for the festivals. It's just not, mm-hmm. you're, you're, you're playing the lottery ticket again. You should focus on distribution. You have a marketable product. You have a good thing. Boom, boom, boom. And I laid out this entire, and you just saw his eyes just like, oh my God, thank you so much. Like you would have wasted a year. And I, and I also told him like, and let's say you get into one of these film festivals for your kind of movie, which is kind of like basically a, a rom- like a comedy, comedy, like a comedy, romantic comedy, something like that. How much does a Sundance Laurel really mean? Bottom line, the bottom line, like on, on, on how much money, extra money are you going to get for that? Exactly. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, I was in, in, in Cannes this year, I listened a lot to the panel talks with this new, um, you know, idea like that you can, we know it's now different. Listen to distribution panels. Um, went in there, talked to the guys and <laughs> there's seriously people still doing exactly this. Well, here's how you get your movie. What do you do? Okay, um, and ask them. So don't call us, don't email me. But here's how you write the emails, but don't email me, right? Uh, we do eight movies a year. I'm talking of short films, right? Yeah, in yeah. this case, in that case. Yeah. So it was short film. Um, and I asked them, so do you engage in marketing? Uh, well, usually we don't. But so what's the uh, exploitation uh, strategy with these? Well, we put them on the festival run. Well, I can't do this myself. Um, but also... Um, isn't doesn't festival mean paying money instead of making money? Where, yeah, where's, it, the, where's the revenue? So there is absolutely no idea, in, in the, including the top distributors who are on these markets, on these film festivals, how to actually exploit generate revenue for you. Right, it, it, film festivals are cultural events. You know, they're not. Jonathan Wolf, the the, the guy who runs AFM, said that very clearly. He's like. A market is a business. Like they're about money, and film festivals are cultural events. They have right. nothing to do with business, at least yeah. for the filmmaker. You're on their uh, on their <laughs> side, it's all about the business. <laughs> but in the but in the front for the filmmakers means nothing. How about is it if you if you get into a festival and you fill the audience with you know, three or four showings of like two three hundred people each, you get nothing, just the pleasure I, of being there. Exactly. I was exactly. I was a. You know, I can say on many of these events with movies, I which you know, made it to Sundance and stuff. That mm-hmm. you, I was actually sitting there in front of the audience or at dinners and events, and I felt bad that we're spending this kind of money. <laughs> right? Of what? That that's just to, you know for you. It's an ego trip. It's an ego trip. Ego trip. It's it's and, an ego trip. And if you, I I felt really. Uh, you know, this is again is very parallel to these. We have music publishers, so-called publishers, where they'll wine and dine, and you know, when the band is playing in the club, and no, no one involved on the dining table can do anything for the band, but the band is paying for that. But, so this God. is the same situation we have in movies still. So um, maybe it's just we need education with produ- for producers and for creators to tell them, do you really want this? Look at this with fresh new eyes. There's alternatives, and um, I'm. I want to. I, I am building alternatives to this. Not only advice, but really alternatives how we can change this. Do you think that this downfall of distributor is a sign of, like the? Are they the Lehman Brothers of of the distribution business? Can they be a, on a much smaller, obviously much smaller yeah. scale? <laughs> are they are they the crack in the in the armor that? Not only for film aggregate, I think for film aggregators is specifically the question, but generally in distribution, because I, I do feel that nobody knows what's going on. Nobody really knows how to make real money in the distribution game anywhere because things change weekly now. So yeah. do you think it's a sign? Uh, it's a bit like the dot-com bubble. In, Correct. What was it, 2000-something? Right? 99, it's yeah, 99. 99, right? So this the first time 
everybody thought it's just a hype and there's really no value. And that was the first dot com. And after that, is there's real value being created. Um, and I think this is the phase we're in, well, almost in right now. We're, too, we're a bit early, right? It's still like we have, you know, from the hearsay, we have to do something. We have to have a digital strategy, but nobody knows what that really means. Also, I have to admit that this, how can you? Because all these channels which are coming out now, I mean, we, we're facing, we're looking at 3,000 something channels right now. Many of them, Channels, I mean, video streaming platforms. Niches, yeah, niche, niche yeah, markets. Right. Some are, va- from, yeah, some are actually mainstream. For example, uh, one of our gr- amazing uh, users is uh, Tubi TV. I don't know if uh, mm, you're aware of, of it. Of course. Tubi TV has a, one of the highest per title rates available. Um, what do they do? Advertisement based. Ooh, isn't that bad? No, it's how <laughs> networks used to work, uh, or still do. And, and that's and, and I've been telling that I've been preaching it from the top of the mountain. I'm like, guys, the money is not in TVOD. TVOD is dead. It is going to be AVOD and some SVOD. And a but AVOD is the growth part of this model yeah, now, right? Without question. And I, I and I like that you're saying this and you're seeing this. And I even go further and say, well, you know what? I don't even know where it's going to be. There might be a combination because it's Hybrid, so early. Yeah. That's what I meant. It's so early because TVOD was just, what, two years ago? Everything was TVOD. <laughs> right. uh, people were like, making – I mean I have, I've had people on the show that have made millions of dollars on TVOD. But that was three years ago. Right. And they also had massive audiences and they knew what they were doing and it was a whole thing. And this is now my plea is also we need to create a sustainable model. Um, mm-hmm. If you think when you if you make your movie as I don't know let's say you make it for five million that's a big deal right and you sell it for seven at uh, to Amazon you know um, studios not Amazon Prime but Amazon Studios um, do you really think this is a sustainable model? Don't you think like well somebody's got to pay for it at the end if you deliver a shit film they won't make seven. So somebody's got to pay for it at the end of the day. So now, if you think, if you believe you have a hit or a solid f- product in your hand, why would you give it away and say, well, I'd rather take like something and I'm out? Then shouldn't you own it and have it for long term and build your actually wealth? Portfolio. 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 Portfolio too, but also like a revenue stream. Instead of so either you don't believe in it, then yeah, then you shouldn't be selling it overpriced because that's not sustainable. If you do believe in it, you shouldn't sell it either because um, you know you should participate and and have a portfolio and have a catalog. So this this whole system of like, look, I sold my movie for two million more than I made it, um, unless it makes its money, it's just you contributing to the death of our industry. Wow, that's that's amazing statement. I love that statement. It's it's absolutely true. There is no model right now laid out, generally speaking, as a sustainable model. Uh, you know, I'm putting out the 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 thesis of being a film entrepreneur, which is being an entrepreneurial filmmaker, which is creating multiple revenue streams from your movies and doing it not once. But multiple times where you can create a portfolio which has a ton of – and all of a sudden after two, three years of doing something like that, all of a sudden you've got enough money to pay the mortgage, to do what you love to do. Right. I mean it's the, the bottom okay. line the, – the, and I want everyone listening right now and watching this right now. I want you to understand this. The dream of being a filmmaker, or being a creator is not – to be a multimillionaire living up in the Hollywood Hills. That's fantastic. I would love to, to walk down the path that Robert Rodriguez did or Kevin Smith did or any of these you know icons of the 90 independent film movement. But isn't the goal to be sustainable, to have food on your plate, to food, food on the table, a roof over your head, and to do what you love to do for a living? Isn't that the dream? It doesn't matter what the scale is. Exactly. And there's only an upside to this. It's and you can say honestly that you never ripped off someone, because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if exactly. is, if your goal is not to be ripped off by a ripping off, I mean that's just, then you're part of it. Don't don't complain then. Go back. You know, <laughs> uh, then repeat. But if you want to, right? And now is the opportunity. Also, yeah. like part of this, as you say, is the uh, I, I call it, it's the multi-track distribution strategy. Is you you said very rightly, it's like the 360 
uh, idea of like there's all kinds of revenue streams. I'm doing the same thing. I'm I'm educating so much about. Look, there is a world outside Amazon, Hulu, and Netflix. And it's a grand world, and that's your opportunity world. These are actually not your opportunity. It's a system which is not built for you. The system which is built for you is the one we're building right now. Everyone is building right now, not only Film Hub, but it's the system of where are the eyeballs? Go go for the eyeballs. I mean, by the way, we have – there was a time, and it still is the case, where um, – Production companies thought they could create their own channels. Not even Warner was able to do this, right? It's, it's, um, th- that's not where the eyeballs are. Netflix had the eyeballs because of the DVD business. Amazon sneaked in the Prime business by promising you free shipping. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. I mean, come on, there is... Hulu was owned by a TV companies, so they did the rerun. So the, the eyeballs were there. You're right. right. And so. now, but now Apple, Disney, Disney Plus, I'm interested in. But they also have a lot of content. Right. <laughs> right. I, with them, I'm a bit, you know, you cannot watch them. They just pull the movies under your, you know, like a rug on your feet always and put it back on the market. And for 10 but, years, you cannot watch that. But that's gone now. That's, they, they, they're stopping that model with Disney Plus. They're putting up their. Their like classics, was, yeah. That whole model is—it's gone. They're dead, right? Yeah. I was so angry always. Oh, <laughs> I know. It, you know, and it was—it was always smart because <clears throat> back in the day when I was still hustling hard uh, in the DVD market, I would when one of those would hit, I would buy twenty of them. I would literally <laughs> stack them. Yeah. I would stack them. I would put them in a closet and wait about a year and a half or two years after they release, and then I would just oh. put them up on eBay. So I would easily double, if not sometimes triple. My money on it, and it was just a nice little extra, little extra side hustle that I had going on. I love that idea, That's and great. I did it with VHSs too. I started when I was in the video store doing VHSs. Sorry that the business model is now uh, invalidated by by Disney Plus, <laughs> but, no, but Disney Plus, for example, is it's still their own catalog. Yeah, I mean Disney has been great in acquiring <sighs> other brands, right, yes. you know, and uh, very cool how they expanded, but. To me, this means not – I know, and we have enough data about this. Not everyone wants to watch the same big shoot all over all the time. There is 72% uh, last year of all subscribers of the big um, subscription services said – 72% said there's not enough variety. They want to see more variety of, of movies and shows. Um and that's what you call niche or I call vertical or just there's various interests. And it's no longer the case that there is – we do not have to cater to the masses only. Um, it's a bit of this mm-hmm. long tail theory. You mm-hmm. might be familiar. It's this Very much. curve. There's a lot under, under the lower end of the curve and only like the – you know I call this not even top 1%, but like on the left side, the percent. Mm-hmm. What it likes to call premium content. I call everything premium content. Everything is premium. If you just reach an audience of 60,000, you have a premium content. If you are able to monetize it. Yeah, so it basically premium, and I use this example all the time, and I, I say to, to filmmakers, if the only thing that's going to be able to break through all this noise is going to be niche a, a programming, which is, let's say, you know, are you a surfer? If you're a surfer and there's a movie about a surfer up there, it will cut through all the noise because you said, this really interests me. If I'm a skateboarder, if I'm a vegan, if I'm a filmmaker and I'm, I want to watch a movie about filmmakers at Sundance, which is my movie, uh, then that's a movie that, that will cut through all of the other noise because it really talks to me as opposed to Avengers, which is great and it's fun and I loved it. But you know, there's only so many of those out there. And at a certain point, you got to cut All through. Right. right. And there's a certain fatigue in the audience, too, because they now know there's more stuff. And it's been withheld from them. Because I've heard about that. I, I, I got all these, you know, um, um, online communities in general, like Facebook groups and stuff. Uh, the top, oh, here's my top 20 list of horror movies uh, last week. And then there's these notes, oh, no longer on Netflix. Uh, well, you can get it there. And then there's a link of like an illegal download because it's no longer available, right? Um, this is the bullshit we've been doing with holding content from, from the audience who actually knows much better now. Yeah. And that's just the beginning of it. Um, there's no big billboards needed on Santa Monica Boulevard. 
Mm. Uh, it works. I'm um, sorry. It does work for certain type, and I'm not saying what the studios are doing is wrong. Uh, there is an audience for this too. Fantastic, but there, it's no longer the only way. But it's a different business model, and then that's another thing that we as independent filmmakers so often we're trying to follow the model set by the studios, which you can't do. You can't make a romantic comedy with no stars in it and expect anybody to show up because you don't have the market. Like the studios can make a a, a romantic comedy with maybe a, an unknown and put it out there because they have a hundred million dollars that they're going to pump into the marketing. So right. everybody knows about it, whether it makes right. money or not, you know, irrelevant at this point today. Right. Um, I wanted to ask you really quickly, a couple questions in regards to traditional distribution. What advice do you have for filmmakers dealing with traditional distributors? Because I do think there are places for traditional distribution and distribution companies if they're the right partner and if it matches or is aligned with the goals of your film. You know, like, you know, you and I both have film, you know, we're both friends with Linda and Michael from Indie Rights, which is quote unquote a traditional distributor, but I don't really consider them a traditional distributor. Yeah. Right. They're, they're, but, but there are certain distributors that are out there that actually do, that are honest, that are straightforward, that really care about the film. They're rare, and I do know a handful of them, but there are not many of them out there. So, so how, what, what do you, what's your advice? Yeah, no, they're more like consultants, or how would you, I would call them like the packaging, the package distribution. So they help you create the, the full-on package. And that service is, there's definitely a value. Um, that's why what we're building with FilmUp is this machine where they can use that too. And actually, indeed, Linda does. You know, they're using this um, to get your stuff out in the world. But there's certainly added value to get a marketing package or get a, uh, a promotion, get a social media package going. Um, you can't just put it up there and hope for the best. I mean, then you know, might as well not do it. But uh, so what? That's what these great companies do. It's a bit like a good music supervisor, you know, who listens to new music. There's there's others who just or agents, in best idea. There's agents who look out for you, and there's most of them don't. They just call you and say, oh, "Hi, what did you do last week? What can I charge you?" Um, so th this is e exactly the same. So, a general advice of how to watch out that they, um, if you have the right partner, is hard to say. Well, let, so so uh, so regards to the right partner. Let's say you you you're going into business with the wrong partner. Let's say we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> go into a predatory deal because you're exhausted you have no other outsource you, you've spent three hundred thousand dollars of your mom's retirement account on this black and white movie that has no stars in it and you know and you got one predatory distributor that says you know what here's the deal what are those points that and i could go off about i want to hear what yours are as well but what are a few of those points that you should go this is a red flag you'd be better off just going through you know, a company like Indie Rights or, or a company like yours and doing the self-distribution model, at least you own it, whether you'll be able to make that 300000 that You've made mistakes way beyond before you got to this point. <laughs> right. uh, but, or do you want to just, I always call it a non-tax deductible donation <laughs> to, to these companies. That's what it is. It's a non-tax deductible d d donation to the company, basically to the distributor. <laughs> yes, you're so right. And unfortunately, <laughs> it's so very little value, but so if you go through the contract, a regular distribution contract, a standard distribution contract, there is not a single thing in there which I would recommend doing. <laughs> so you're asking the wrong guy. I'm sorry. You, you, There's nothing. There's yeah. just nothing. There's no, nothing. There is, they, everything in there is, if they tell you something, it's probably the opposite of what they write in there, is that you lose control about spending. You lose control about what to do with your title, with your movie. Um now, I, look, I don't want to make Linda look back. Uh, you know what I mean? Like there are values, but usually it's, uh, if you go through contract, like how would you prevent this from happening? It's very hard because these contracts are what, you know, they tell you or that everybody signs it. That's already a red flag. Um, that you have to pay anything is a red flag. Um, I think it's all about transparency. These companies today have to count to you on, on a monthly basis, not on a yearly or a six-month basis. Um, and I would absolutely ask for approval rights, which you probably won't get. Um, there is, look, I mean, I work with like top directors, like um, there's only like, what, a handful of directors have final cut in this town. Oh, yeah. Um, Very so, few. Right, but no one of these guys makes 
use of it. So if you have a distributor, let's turn it around, who says, well, we have the right, and you don't have the right to approve it, but if they give you in, in practice the opportunity to say no or to, to work with you on it, now, then that's great, but the only thing is, how would you know this up front? So now I actually want to hear from you, what do you think is a good feature well, set to look out for? I mean, a, a, a few, a, I, could show, I could talk to you about warnings that I've, I've experienced. Um, the concept okay. of cro cross -collatera uh, co yeah. collateration, which is a longer conversation, and we can talk about that later. It's a deep Deep, uh, deep, deep ridiculousness. Well, all right, just so everybody, because everyone's going to go, Alex, what is cross collateration? I can't say the damn word. Col uh, collateration. Um, um, cross collateration, whatever that word is, is when they basically have, there's two ways of doing it, but I'll, I'll talk about the first one, is you have one movie, and say your movie, uh, you go to a buyer, and that buyer wants to buy that movie for uh, $10,000. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show and, for, and, the, and the territory of Germany, for let's say. And then the distributor goes, oh, wait a minute. I'm going to package ten, uh, nine other movies in with this movie. You still only have to pay me $10,000, but I'm going to throw in nine other movies for you. So now you would have gotten whatever, 70%, 60%, 80%, whatever that did, of that $10,000. But now you get it of $1,000. And that is cross collateration, and they do the same thing with expenses as well. Um, length. Oh of no, the, no, no. There they charge like ten times, not like. Oh no, times. yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, <laughs> they buy, yeah, if you buy, let's, if you if you spend money on DVDs, oh yeah, uh, yeah. If you spend. Let's say you spend five thousand dollars on on DVDs, and they don't sell, and it still costs you five thousand yeah, dollars, and yeah, then yeah. you make five thousand dollars off of a streaming deal, they'll throw it all in the pot, and you got zero. As opposed to like, I didn't approve that five thousand you spent. Oh, but you made five thousand over here, so uh, but I'm not going to take a hit. I'm the distributor, so why should I take a hit? There's, there's that. There's length of agreement, which is, I, I mean, I literally, I literally saw this with a filmmaker who's probably watching this, and I won't say the name of the movie, but it was a deal from one of these big reputable companies who have a nice logo, um, and the deal was fifteen years. 15 years and it was a hundred or a hundred and fifty thousand dollar market cap uh, marketing cap 15 years mm -hmm. and i told him he's like alex i i think i know what you're going to tell me i'm like yeah run the hell away yeah, yeah. run i mean it was so you know length of agreement there's there's so many different things so you know, one of the but reasons I what go ahead. I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I don't even know if there are. I don't know of any contracts which are vastly different. I well, I mean, know, Linda, Linda, years, 15 years. I mean, Linda and in Indie Rights is probably the only one of the few companies out there that does like you know a three year deal, and they're completely transparent with all their filmmakers. So there's no there's no hiding behind anything. They're really upfront with you. They tell you exactly what they're going to do and what they're not going to do. And and that's basically a good. I mean, that's a that's one of the reasons why I went with them for my for my films because they also make sense for my budget my my budget range and things like that. So that that's a probably it's probably one of the best deals in town. She's a unicorn. There's no question about it. Indie Rides is a unicorn. There are not many of them flying around. You are a unicorn. That's not many of you flying around. So they're they're just different models, different opportunities. But is there a, a place for them? Possibly, because I've also huh. heard of filmmakers who has signed those deals that maybe it was like a five year or seven year deal. And they got a Showtime deal out of it. They got a Redbox deal out of it. Th you know, they got a, a family video deal out of it where they're like still selling DVDs to family video, which is the only living video store chain left in the middle of the country somewhere. <laughs> but they, but they go out and they make these, you can't do that on a self distribution model. You can't do that you know, doing those kind of, it's more difficult, if not impossible. So are there potentials? Yes, but I do believe that they are outliers. They are not the usual. They're just like, oh, by the way, we submitted it to Redbox and Redbox kind of liked what you had. So they're going to give you a 2000 DVD order. Yeah, these are all dying models anyway. That's a problem, right? <sighs> Agreed. I don't think this, is, everything I just laid out are, you're grasping to the final the yeah. final bit of money that's flying around. And, and I also wanted to say, it, 
right now we're in arguably a good economic environment. As soon as the next bubble bursts or the next downturn comes, which you know is coming any day now, it's going to happen within the next year, if not Mm -hmm. shorter, year or two, we're way overdue. Mm -hmm. Something's going to happen. And I think it's going to be probably worse than 2008. Mm -hmm. And if that does, I'm not being a conspiracy, but it's just like, it's just history. I mean, we see it. Mm -hmm. How do you think our industry is going to survive? Like it barely, it barely took the hit of 2008. I remember Mm -hmm. 2008 and it was just like, people were just, companies were folding, movies were being lost. It was just, and we're getting, we're having trouble in a good situation as economically. Can you imagine once the pressure Mm -hmm. of the world comes crashing down on our little business? Yeah, but but I totally agree. But Mm -hmm. I see this as an opportunity again, because I think who, who get hit the most are those old industry types? Because these deals and dealing, deal making, and they're fat. oh my gosh, I, fat. that's yeah, yeah. Because there's a high margin in for all these guys, just not the creator and not the consumer, <laughs> uh, right? right? I mean, that's this is where we the, that's where it gets skimmed off. It's it's crazy, um, but that means that you with your low budget, medium budget, um, you financed it uh, in an alternative way. Look, I, I talked to high profile um, producers, including New York. They tell me in the last three years they haven't done a traditional financing on on any movie. It's been all Netflix and Amazon. That is to me super red alert. This that's is like scary. the highest dependency uh, ever. Um, I personally know, okay, well, we're on, we're on air or something, but we, I don't, I, I see the bubble also with Netflix. I see this is a high dependency, which is at high risk. Their financing is not secure. Their model to me is high risk. They have a lot of debt. They have a tremendous amount of debt. Tremendous yeah. amount of debt. Yeah. And all they do is that the difference is they don't sell tickets, but subscriptions, but that can you know, change as the tickets can change. So um, I wouldn't, I, uh, and then you have nothing left as a, as a, as a you know, producer. I've worked with so many, even high profile producers. I'm, I'm not saying $100 million movies, but like solid movies, $20 million movies. They haven't, after the initial deal, they didn't see any, any, any money. They get a short time deal. Yeah. But that's they're supposed to represent it, and then there's no money for them anymore. Nothing gets reported is late. Uh, it's you know of the infamous uh, uh, Harry Potter uh, Warner Brothers. Have no, you, no, oh, I didn't hear I, that one. Oh, I'll send. I you, you can repost it. Um, the uh, the report that there was no, there's no uh, no profit on which uh, on which Harry Potter on all of well, no uh, no no there were. Uh, I, I'll send you this this thing which went around. This is a copy of a, of a of a profit report of a royalty report where the whoever recipient was saw nothing because it was all and the, and the revenue was what we're talking of like a half a billion dollars something. Right? Huh. So there's uh, all kinds of interesting accounting ways. So oh, I mean, it was is, like Forrest Gump. Remember Forrest Gump? They came out publicly and said, "Oh no, Forrest Gump. We we it's we're in the, we're still in the red on on, on Forrest Gump." <laughs> And then, like, it made six hundred and eighty-three million dollars. Are you that incompetent? Are you that incompetent of a company that you cannot make a profit on a movie that cost you X dollars? And like, yeah. And again, I compare this always, always to the music industry, who we see is it is ahead of us, and we can see what the solutions are. When you had a, a platinum record, you would be still paying your record company, owing your record company, mm-hmm. but. If you sell 60,000 records or 30,000 on your own, touring all the time, you can make a fantastic living. You actually make more than you know, T-shirts. Your- don't forget T-shirts, hats, photo opportunities. Right. Yeah, yeah I, the bands are starting to sell uh, photo ops in the back. So to go backstage, you'll, you'll charge you 150 bucks. You can come back. We'll take a yes. picture. We'll talk That's for a second. That's great. I love it. Why love not? It. It's love hey, it's another revenue stream, you know. So and- we have to come up with more revenue streams for filmmakers too. Um, musicians have have this life. Uh, channel right so now but what we what for example film up does is we say and there's a lot of education about this too go i get you is you have to go as many uh, multi-channel strategy look last year if you bank on am oh, i do amazon on my own and mm-hmm. i don't trust any other guys um do you get a payment rate hit from of 74 percent and you don't even know how much they pay now they're taking all these titles offline and they don't tell you why and which ones and uh, why they did this there's no way this is like a it's a complete um 
um, it's an authoritarian uh, uh, state of, of uh, f uh, video streaming and film streaming. So um, you must not rely on, on a handful or even less of these domestic channels. You have to go super wide. And, and would, would you agree? I don't mean to interrupt you, but do you agree that you need to look at your film as a investment in a portfolio? You can't invest in one stock. You need to have a diverse stock. You have to have diverse revenue streams coming in. And if it's $5 here, $10 there, $100 here, $2,000 there, every month that, that those revenue streams come up because if one goes down, you've got other revenue streams that could pick up and, and cover it. But if you put all your eggs in that one basket, this is what they do. And it's like right. doing that with a, a traditional distributor sometimes. It, it cannot be a good thing, especially the predatory ones. Like you're putting everything in this one this is right. the only channel. The only way I can make money with my movie is the old, the old way, which is, which is BS. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. No, no, it's BS and dangerous. These Very. things are actually dangerous and high, it's high risk suddenly to a, to a product you have. Um, no, so we need to go wide. And I mean, we, and then the most obscure things often have we had this thing where suddenly China ordered hundreds of independent yes. indie, uh, um, 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 Indian films, like Bollywood, you would call it, but they're mm -hmm. not Bollywood really. Suddenly this worked, who knows? And, and this, this multilateral, um, well, flow, uh, pun intended for streaming, right? Uh, and today, it's much. It's getting much, much easier. For example, get um, you English uh, speak uh, English material out. We might not even need captions when captions are needed by some channels, but technically, but uh, you, you 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 have a good chance of having your English uh, um, language title out in many countries of the world. As like ten years or five years ago, it was harder. They wanted like their local only and harder mm -hmm. to get mm -hmm. in. Um, and then you had distributors telling you, "Well, it's not the, the demand is not big enough to get in there." Blah, blah, blah. But there's yeah. no more big enough these days. It's, that doesn't count anymore. Look, Brad Pitt just got beat at the box office by Downton Abbey. <laughs> I'm, I'm just throwing that out there. Okay, <laughs> like Brad Pitt, arguably one of the biggest movie stars in the world, got bitten, beaten by a mm -hmm. ni by a niche mm -hmm. film. That it's niche. I'm not going to watch that now. I mean, that's not my crowd. I don't want to watch that. But to its audience, they came out with a gangbusters. And not any of those stars in that movie could open any movie ever. But in Downton Abbey, they could. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. It's not beautiful. It, it's a it's great a, story, I think. Yeah, it um, is. And it's, it, it started out as, okay, it was a relatively high budget TV show. But still, you know, it's, it's coming out of nowhere. Really, right, right, right. I mean, you're, you're, still, the, you're talking about a space, like a hundred million plus dollar Brad Pitt vehicle. Like, <laughs> I mean, your chances of, and then it's like, oh, it's also about that drama about, you know, yeah. you know, like a, a British drama, a British you're drama. British, yeah, it's a BB, so it's a BBC, a BBC episode yeah. out there, an hour and a half episode that's beating Brad Pitt. $100 million. Dollars. It's a beautiful world. And we have this. Look, I have, like I said, we have oh, so many titles on the platform. I, so many that I cannot watch them anymore. Uh, all of them, definitely. I look in there and some of them, I have to admit, look, we don't curate, right? So what I, what I say is it's, it's a principle and major feature is there's no one, can, no one can tell you if a movie is good or will make money. That's different too, by the way, right? Mm -hmm. um, very different. So, uh, who am I to say that? Even though our industry is full of these people who, who you know, on markets that tell you, oh, no, this is, oh, have you heard? No, I don't, don't know. I haven't. Nobody told me yet that it's good. I have to hear from others too, first. And all this BS. So we have all these titles, and, and some of them I thought, oh, my God, that's not good. <laughs> that's really, oh, embarrassing. Okay, well, we get all that too. Okay, well, since we don't curate, we get everything, right? So this, But the system works differently with, with a platform like this. So, and there were, titles in there which made the first weekend so much money when they came out on Amazon and all these streaming services were like I would have never thought myself and I pride myself on like knowing a little bit about the movie industry but who no am I to anything. say no nobody knows anything. knows anything I worked on Brad Pitt movies which completely tanked um, yeah. I worked with directors who did the Brad Pitt movie before mine which completely tanked I worked, he worked with me and it was a big hit so you just you never know you never know. You cannot. Nothing is hundred percent or even ninety percent. Um, 
you and that's why on the positive side as an independent filmmaker you know Downton Abbey is not that indie right no. but uh, but still it's it's the direction where it comes from compared compared to a Brad Pitt vehicle Definitely. it is it's it's pretty yeah. indie <laughs> but it's not yeah. indie i know what you mean and there is lots of um there's lots of butter out there for your bread. That's that's the point. And oh, good quote. I like get, that. <laughs> get that. Get a little bit off that, and 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 get it in chunks, little chunks. And um, now, and, real quick, really quickly, I want to I want to give you an opportunity to talk specifically about Film Hub because uh, you've been so gracious with your time talking about the business in general. Uh, I do want to give a you know a little bit of time to just please tell everybody the business model and what you do at Film Hub. So um, you might have now heard through this great friend like this. I don't believe in the old system of distribution and um, aggregation. Uh, so what I build Film Up out is it's not an aggregator. I can tell you what it's not. It's not an aggregator. It's not a distribution company. It is a a platform or a in Silicon Valley call it a marketplace. It's more like Airbnb than um, A24. So it's what what you do is you have a movie or you have a show. You upload it. And you're one of the users. There's no cost involved whatsoever for you. Um, you enter, you know, it's very, hopefully very professionally done. I hope you guys agree. We upload all the data you usually would give a, uh, as a deliverable to a distribution company. And then on the other side, we have these buyers. We have um, of hundreds of channels, uh, video streaming platforms, buyers, who this, uh, these titles get marketed to. So they can browse the catalog in the traditional way, but they're also we, we're using more and more AI tools and deep learning tools to match what they like. So they these are, get, and these are buyers. These are buyers exactly. So then they order the titles from the platform, and it's also free for them as well. Um, then the whole deliverable process of like you know uh, what you get charged for a distributor etc this is all included you know you don't have to pay anything because we put this into into the cloud and it costs us almost nothing or it's just development so the, we take the whole distribution process online and then when someone watches it on let's say i don't know china mobile because they bought your title. In this case, license means usually 99% means they get the title for free. You have a performance model. When someone is watching him or you get a share of the subscription fees, they come through us. Um, we also consolidated a nice looking dashboard so you can see what country your revenue is coming from, etc. And then with our latest update, you can actually withdraw it. So far, we've been still like paying quarterly. Do, so, you, do, you, uh, do you only do features or do you do shorts as well? Shorts. We have a lot of shorts. We even have some really? special deals with some cable channels sometimes who, who put out like uh, short festivals on, I mean, uh, cable festivals. Short form, uh, Facebook Watch is um, still not out what's actually that going to be, but it's all about short form. I think short form is the future, by the way. There's so much short form demand because that's how users behave. You know, I mean, my 16 year old. No, sorry. Eighteen-year-old daughter cannot listen to a song for more than a minute. So you know what I mean? Like, they used to be eight minutes long when we had vinyl albums. Jeez, and now I mean, like Queen, after- Queen. I mean, Queen alone. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and it's a big hit in the, in the theaters too. So look, yeah. I mean, there's still demand for this, but like, skip after a minute. Uh, um, so the attention span is very low. So short form is actually great. Um, it, I'm not promising you will be a millionaire with this, but it's a very fair system where you get what comes in. We take a, a, a small share. We take 20% of what comes in at this point. We're still thinking about the business model, how to adjust it, but that's just to keep the lights on. But there's no, co- but there's no cost up front. There's no cost, no. And it's only found money. So you have a movie, there's nothing to lose. And you can take it off any you, – you just – Put a notice in for us. You want to take it off, or you can even say, "Hey, I made a deal in Italy." <laughs> um, pull it off of Italy. Pull it off of Italy, and because we have like this rights management thing built in. You click Italy away, and that's it. So you can manage your digital catalog and so, make so there, money. And there's a lot of films, out, a lot of filmmakers out there who do have short films, maybe some award-winning short films that possibly could even. If it's twenty dollars a month, would you pick it up if it was on the floor? That's what I always tell people. Like, you don't need to be making 10, 20, 50, 100,000 a month if it's 20 extra dollars. It takes you a minute to do it. And over the course of the next three to four years, that might grow. It might go down. It might stay the same. It's $20 that you didn't have to work for. Exactly. 
you it's, know? I don't understand. When we have even like a smaller production companies who have like, I don't know, 20, 25 titles, you know, they produce themselves and and they say, oh, we, you know, some of them are domestic, some of them are from all around the world. And we have New Zealand, we have everywhere. And they say, well, we didn't have access to this market before and it, it wasn't cost effective to go to AFM after eight years of this title being around or three years. But right. it's only all titles. We have all, over 50% of our titles are three years and, and, and younger, which is I was surprised too. I thought well, first people will try out with their old catalogs, but no. Is this is hope? After I mean, you can still do a festival run. You can still do whatever you like. It's just augmenting and helping out basically and creating found revenue you didn't have before. That's amazing. And, and we have lots of ty- uh, filmmakers, lots of filmmakers who actually make a living off this now, which Shocking. makes me very proud. Stop yeah, it! But- <laughs> Stop it, Klaus! Stop it! And it's like it's like you don't need. You know, t- deals. You just, this is where, now, you could, of course, say, well, Klaus, you said earlier, you, you need to, you know, keep doing, yes, you need to market and promote your title. If you just put it up, yeah, all right. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now, back to the show. But if you do marketing if you get into the social media for example facebook you know it's still you you might hate it or love it it's still effective um to to work the social media and you can recreate an audience or reactivate an audience even on a title which is two years old which is not old it's just brand new nobody has ever for most of them it's brand new Mm -hmm. um so you you tried your festival run didn't work or you have titles even falling back to you after 15 years oh my god but uh or three or imagine? something yeah. um you know if if um this is like we i pride myself in like we take everything and only the good stuff makes money right. now everybody thinks they have good stuff but not everyone will make money with it because it's maybe not as good as they think but who am i to say so these are the features right we don't curate you can upload you don't have to pay you keep all your rights. Uh, you can cancel any time. And, um, and our channels, they, they love this system because we create like it's – because it's technology. So they're, it makes it so easy for them and there's so little mistakes. And it's very fast. I mean it used to be many months until your title went live somewhere, including making deals uh, even longer. Mm-hmm. And now um, after the initial upload is done and it's on the marketplace – it can be a few days until it's out and live. That's amazing. That's amazing. Well, Klaus, um, I have a few questions uh, I have to ask. I ask all of my guests if you have a, if you have a minute. I know we've gone. We've gone. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it's not your fault. I I will stop it if it's bad, sir. We have, this it is really good, really yes. good, really good information, and I hope everyone out there is appreciative of it. Now, what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to get into the business today? Um. It, there's no better time than now, and become an entrepreneur filmmaker. Don't a, fil- a film entrepreneur, if you will. Excellent. Did you come up with that? Yes, I have a whole website, podcast, and a new book coming out. <laughs> Wait a minute, who's promoting now? <laughs> <laughs> do you not see? Do you not see the hat, sir? Do you not see? You know, don't no, hate the player, hate the game, sir. Let's move on. <laughs> like, yeah. And the good news is, look, what we also do is. It's a business. I'm not. This is not a, uh, a, a non-for-profit. It is a business, and I hope it's going to be a big business. Because if it's a big business, we can show this industry that it that the new mainstream is the independent and is the verticals and is the the uh, lower medium budget becoming hits. Um, and that's what the audience wants. If we can prove it, which so far it's it's doing very well. It's we have. Uh, you know, I can give you all the metrics like growth 8% a month and, and all these things. But there's an audience who wants to see this, even the most, you know, what others would call obscure and not uh, exploitable uh, uh, titles. So, so now is a good moment to create film, become the entrepreneur, um, raise enough, no, not raise enough funding, but but include in your budget or in your time schedule a to Z, including distribution and promotion, even if it means you hire someone to do it. But don't stop by making it and turn you, you know, your head to your baby and uh, your back to your baby and, and move on to the next one. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Oh, so, 
out of a million lessons. Um, um, wow, that's a that's a deep question. Um, I oh man, I learned so many lessons. Um, the longest the one that took you the longest to learn. Um, actually, <laughs> that sounds now a bit corny, but to never give up. I have still not hundred percent clear, and to say no. These are the longest things. I, at the beginning, I said yes to everything because I was so afraid they would never ask me again. Um, and now I still do it a lot and I still think, ah, oh, because it's for the relationship, right? It's for this. If it's nothing you own, meaning, you know, mm -hmm. as a creative, don't do it. And that is super hard to learn because we are also under pressure. Now, what is the biggest fear you had to overcome to get into this business or to do uh, what you do? Look, I, we are creatives, and the worst, the hardest thing is to create from scratch. Um, um, a writer once told me what it is, is you pull, pull, pull gasoline all over you, and you have to light the match. And yeah, I, I'm one who, when I write, I have to suffer <laughs> and to get this out, and it's terrifying. Um, so, wow, it is so hard for me to write as... Um, you have to find a good balance between liking what you do and hating what you do. Uh, both is possible to do too much. Okay, fair enough. Now, uh, the toughest question of all, three of your favorite films of all time. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, here's the first thing. When I started writing major motion pictures, like when I came here about 20 years ago, I virtually stopped watching movies. Because mm. I could... And you have to, you do not know, you don't understand. I was not alive. I was slaving in dark rooms for 18, 16 hours a day. I, I, I come from post-production, sir. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> so to watch a movie on the weekend, no way. Uh, besides, you know, I cannot listen to music. It influenced me while I'm in. A, I, I wrote themes which I had written six years before that. And I reused them and I didn't know that. And nobody told me because everyone was just tired. Only years later, I know. like, wait a minute, that's the exact same what I wrote before. Okay, so all this thing, all this stuff happens. So my movies will not sound like, but uh, what I, um, okay, okay. I have, well, first, like, one of my <laughs> favorite things when I grew up was Lawrence of Arabia, believe of it or not. Of course, of course. Spielberg <laughs> still says one of his best movies of all time. I did not know that, actually. So Spielberg right? watches it every time he watches, he, he, before he directs a movie, he always watches Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> it is like the most inspiring. You just want to be a different person. And that's the movies which you know in fact, uh, affect me the most, which change your life a bit. Then um, my 15-year-old son turned me on to a film which was done in the 90s called uh, L'Enfant, The Child. Uh -huh. um, the Darden Brothers, the Dan Braden Brothers, sorry. Uh -huh. If you don't know it, must watch it. Okay. That's a movie where, I don't know, it was made for $2.50. And gets the impact of a $200 million movie on you. Okay. And I don't have a third one. I can't just let me think about it. Um, but, um, but see, that's my range. Um, between, I'm, I'm a sucker for the mainstream stuff, I have to admit, right? That's I really okay. love, I love this stuff when it's done right. I love E.T. Come on, really? Like, it's, it's, and pretty much oh. almost, I mean, a lot of things the Spielberg does. You know, he's not, he doesn't hit it out of the park every time. But even his even his foul balls are pretty nice. <laughs> yeah, and and I like the you know commercial. I don't know the early Eddie Murphy. Like there's stories in there, right? Mm -hmm. We don't do this anymore these days. We coming leave. to America, I'm still coming to the, America. I mean, so if you want the third one, I know coming it's not like I wouldn't take this to an island, and that's the only movie I would watch. But I adore these titles, uh, sure. these, these, uh, because again, these are stories um, always like small personal stories with the big backdrop. Um, that's awesome. But I've done also, I, I even love movies I did myself, which is rare. I love this movie called Little Nick or Petit Nicolas, mm -hmm. which was one of my favorite uh, story uh, books uh, done in the 50s. And not because I did the music, trust me, I'm usually. Pff, I understand. You know, I, I understand. But um, that was well done. The humor was great. And, and it's totally independently done. And it's something, nothing we would really watch in America. But. Mm -hmm. um, there's a chance that one day we might get a bit more international stuff here so we can actually watch. 
I think mm. we're getting to that point. There's so much more stuff around the world that's coming in. I mean, even on 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 Netflix, you're getting shows from from Latin America, from Europe, um, from India uh, that are you know. I mean, I was watching a telenovela the other day on Correct. Netflix amazing, be- right? yeah, because amazing. it was uh, you know it was it was about uh, Celia Cruz, and I I love I'm Cuban so. I love I love uh, her music. I was like, oh yeah, this is a great telenovela. And I, my wife, my wife and I were just sitting there, like, I can't believe I'm watching a telenovela, but this is fantastic. <laughs> I, I know you need to move on. I mean, you need to finish this. But when I was in an Airbnb, the guy from before had still logged into his Netflix, so I got the recommendations of him. Right, totally random guy. And that's also a sign for how bad recommendations are at Netflix. I loved them. It was amazing. And he had primed the, the, you know, it's completely different than me. So I watched this, and now I, I have to get you the title, an in, in uh, a Bollywood action film. Well, that, um, you, you could just stop right there. Bollywood action film. Out, you, you've had me at hello. I mean, come amazing. On. Oh, it was just, everything was blowing up. Oh, uh, <laughs> I've seen some the, of them the on YouTube. Was <laughs> Boats, a race car, we even had like a Formula One car somewhere in South Africa. Did you see that? Li- to- did you see that little India? He's become world famous. They actually did a documentary about him. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. He's this little Indian dude. Like he's yeah, like yeah, yeah. Re- you know he's a little person. But yeah. he's like this action star. And he's kicking the heck out of everybody. He's got all the women, and it was just so. 80s over the top. Right. He, they actually did a documentary searching for where he is in the world. I never saw it, but I heard about it. I was like, this right. is brilliant. This is brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> love, love. And I, I love that too. And again, that's to me indie film, right? I mean, they do this for what, $12 million is a high budget there, right? US dollars, mm-hmm. right? So um, amazing what you can actually pull off with good ideas. And if you like have integrity and you must love what you do, and some hate what you do. You think it's complete bullshit, but yeah, you know that's it's the process. And I loved it. I loved it. I would have never watched it, and I gave it to my my eighteen now eighteen year old daughter for sixteen at the time, and I said, "Hey, you you girls." She was with her girlfriends there. You have to watch this, and they loved it too. So, isn't this great? How you can stuff you would have never watched, never nobody would show you here in the theaters or you know on TV in the old. Old school. I mean, this is why I love The Room so much. I mean, Tommy Wiseau is The Room. I mean, I can watch that. I can't watch it alone because that's just sad. You have to watch it with a group of people. And preferably if you watch it with filmmakers, oh, it's brilliant. <laughs> it's so bad. It's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean, right? Yeah. But yeah. Klausman, thank you. Uh, and where can people find you? Where can people find more about Film Hub and everything? So filmhub.com is the website. There's some information on there. Uh, feel free to hit us. There's a messenger in, on you know, a little box you can click on. Um, we are on Twitter with uh, FilmHubHQ, um, on Facebook with FilmHubHQ. Oops, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, just look for FilmHub. Um, yeah, and, and again, it's a what we do is I want to make sure that you understand that we are just like you on the same side. We are, on the, we are creator first, creator friendly. We don't charge you. It, we are. I'm a filmmaker, right? So um, I have nothing else in mind but helping those um, to create and keep creating. And making money is a good way to keep that 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 brush uh, painting on that canvas. I'm after all, I didn't stay in Köln, Germany. I came to Hollywood. It's it's about <laughs> making money, and uh, and you can. I think today is is better than ever, and it's getting better. And don't let this distributor um, screw up, like um, take you the wrong way. Things like this will always happen. I think it's a big opportunity now that you know it, the the it, we we we're cleaning up here. The industry is cleaning up right now. Absolutely, Klaus, man, it has been an absolute pleasure. We will have to schedule your composing <laughs> episode soon because I'm dying to hear all your stories. There's um, lots of stories, and I'm sorry for the overtime here. Was uh, no, it's fantastic, it's fantastic. Thanks again, Klaus, for being on the show. I want to thank Klaus for this epic conversation about the state of self distribution, the state of distribution in general, and the business model of how filmmakers make money. This is a very, very important topic. And I need to ask you, please, if you enjoyed this episode, share it with five filmmaker friends of yours. Send it out to as many if you can, but at least share this episode with five of your friends because, man, this information really needs to get out there. I don't want to see any more filmmakers lose their shirts, 
lose their dreams, get their hearts crushed by this business, especially if they've gotten the energy and they were able to do the unachievable, which is to make a feature film and finish it and get it out and master it only to fall uh, and as, as Klaus says, turn your back on your baby to move on to something else and give it over to a stranger. So you really need to take complete control and responsibility for your creation, for your film, for your product out there. And this episode really lays out a lot of great nuggets of information, a lot, a lot of knowledge bombs helping you do that. So if you want to get links to anything we discussed in this episode, please head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 349 for the show notes. And I'm going to have a special episode tomorrow, episode 350. It's insane that I've gotten up to 350 episodes of this podcast, but there's going to be a special episode. We're going to talk a little bit about the show and what we've been able to do over the course of the last four years, but also I'm going to be announcing in detail my live boot camp that will be held in Los Angeles, specifically in Burbank, California. But I'll break down everything about that boot camp and what I hope to achieve with it and what I will be doing in the future with the boot camp moving forward. So thank you guys for listening. It's been a pretty long episode, so I'm going to cut it a little short, if you can even call this cutting it short. But thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. I truly, truly appreciate it. And as always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.